Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. The Bible speaks about the spirit of the Antichrist, and his spirit is lawlessness. Now, it's very important that we understand that correctly because many times people hear lawlessness and they think of someone who is simply a criminal, someone who does not conform to society standards. This is not what the scripture is saying. When the Bible speaks of lawlessness, it speaks about one who is opposed to the standards of God, the moral standards of God, the ethical standards. They rebel against the character of God. One of the things we learn from the law of Moses is that we see the character of God. The law of Moses relates to righteousness. It is not an instrument that can be used to make me righteous, but it defines what righteousness is and unrighteousness. And when I hold up God's standard, his law to my life, being unbelieving, it shows me my unrighteousness. But what we're going to learn today is this. When we take that same standard as a believer, it can manifest our faithfulness that we have been declared righteous and God is working righteousness in and out of us. This is the work of the Spirit of God within the believer. We are going to, with maturity, growing in the faith, learning greater biblical truth, we're going to find ourselves being conformed to the image of God, meaning we're going to reflect His character. We're going to walk in His ways. We're going to see our life being conformed to the truth of God. And here's something that's very significant, and that is as we move closer to the end times, and we're doing that rapidly today, we're going to see that the world is going to oppose those who embrace the character of God, the ways of God, the truth of God, the will of God. And that's why, for believers, we are going to be approaching, and we already have, a time of persecution more and more persecution of true believers is happening in more and more a variety of locations that type of of anti-righteousness that spirit that perspective is going to fill the earth and why god eventually will judge this world well with that said take out your bible and look with me to 1 John and chapter 3. The epistle, the first epistle of John, chapter 3. And we're going to begin in verse 13. And we're going to see that, that John here is speaking about how we are called to demonstrate the character of the Torah. Now, one of the things that's going to be stress is loving your brother. Now, the term brother is inclusive. It can mean male or female, brother or sister. It simply means another. And we're going to see places in our text where it says one another, but in that day and age, the term brother was understood as an inclusive term. That, that men were supposed to love not just men and be kind to them, but also females and likewise females. We're supposed to love both females and male, demonstrating their faith, their kindness, fulfilling God's expectation and how we should behave in a godly love towards other people. And that should be consistent in our life. 
that we behave and do our obligations to another that manifest God's character in our life, his righteousness in our life, that we do so in a way that is pleasing to him, that manifests his presence, his character in our life, and that behavior testifies to our faith. It stands out and it will become ever so powerful as a testimony, as something that is different in the last days. So chapter 3, 1 John, beginning with verse 13, it says here, Do not marvel, my brethren. Now, here again, he's speaking to believers. We see that he uses different terms, different uh, titles to speak about believers throughout this epistle. We'll encounter a couple of those today. We've already seen several of those earlier thus far in the study of 1 John. But he says, literally, you do not marvel, do not be amazed, my brethren, if, and hear this, if the world hates you. Now, what that teaches us is this. We ought to have an expectation, a knowledge it, that as I walk in righteousness, perhaps 50 years the world ago, 50 years ago, the world wasn't so opposed to this. In some places, it always has been. But there were numerous places where the cultural pressure, the cultural norms were more biblically based. Those days are fleeing. We are going to see more and more in various places, a growing number of places, that when we walk in faithfulness, the world is going to hate that, move against us, persecute true believers. That's what he's saying. And he's just not saying it's going to happen. He says, don't be surprised by this. Don't be amazed. Don't be marveled, my brethren, if the world hates you, because it will. We know that, and hear this, he says, we know, and this is a knowledgeable but also experiential word. We know that we have passed, and I like this, out of death into the life. Now, notice the the definite article. That's just the word, the. And the life, Most other translations may not have this word, the, it appears in the Greek text. It speaks about a specific type of life, a specific quality, a life with a very, very precise, precise character to it. And that character is that same character that the law of God reflects. It is one of righteousness, holiness, that which reflects the the purposes of God, the mind of God, the truth of God. So he says here, you know, we know, literally it says, that we have passed through. It shows a transition and a transformation because we have passed out of death. What is death related to? Sin in the Bible. These two things come together, sin and death. So when the Bible says we have passed out of death, it's talking about we're not motivated. We're not gravitating to sin, but rather into life. And this is this new life, the very life that is reflected in the purposes of God, the commandments of God, the will of God that reflect the character of God. We have passed out of death into the life because and how do we know this is our our reality that this speaks to us he says he gives us proof because we love the brothers could mean we love the brothers and the sisters we love one another other people so we find that one of the things that testifies and a primary thing that testifies of this new creation that we become through faith, through the grace of God, is that we love others. We love the brothers, meaning this. We have a capacity that the world does not to demonstrate love. 
That same love that God has shown to us through his only begotten son. That while we were still sinners, he loved us. Why there are others who are still sinners, we love them. And we behave in such a way that they are confronted in love with the truth of God. That we stand out. We don't reflect the world which is rooted in selfishness, a self-love that is not the love of God, not reflected in his character. But the selfish love, a prideful love, is, is rooted in sin. So he says we stand out. Because we love the brothers. And then he writes at the end of verse 14, he says, The one who does not love the brother. And this means anyone who is near you. It says, He remains in the death. The death specifically talking about sin. He remains in this. So if my character, and again, I mentioned last week the importance of the, the present tense. And it's showing something here, a consistency. It's not talking about a momentary failure. Something happens and I, I lash out, I don't show love, I, I behave selfishly, pridefully, sinfully. The present here is saying that those times are not the norm. They're not what defines me. They are the exception to the rule. No, the one who hates, if indeed this is his characterization, if he continuously, in a way that's consistent, hates his neighbor, that means that he remains, that death abides in him. Verse 15. Everyone who hates his brother. This one, it says, a murderer is he. Now, what the Bible's doing here is equating a feeling, hatred, with murder. And you say, well, you can hate someone but not murder them. That is true. But we're speaking about a new covenant understanding of the law of Moses. Where do we get that? Well, we get that from Yeshua himself. We all know where I'm going to go now. Sermon on the Mount says don't commit adultery, but if you have feelings that you'd like to commit adultery, then from God's standpoint, you are an adulterer. And in the same way, you have hatred, malice for someone. You don't physically take their life, but inwardly, you wish they were dead before God. He sees that, that condition within you, and he calls you a murder because we're not dealing with the the legal application of the law but the spiritual the one from a heavenly standpoint so he says here everyone who hates his brother he is a murderer and you know that everyone who who is a murderer does not have eternal life in him remaining and again, remaining, it's speaking about the norm, something that is consistent. If someone at times, now let me ask you a question. Is there ever been someone who just murders and murders and murders? I mean, just every moment, that's what he does. Obviously not. Even some of the worst serial killers, they, they, they've lived for 50 years and killed 30 people, 40 people, 60 people, something along that. That means that there's lots of times in their life where they're not practicing murder, but they have that murderous spirit in them. They are a murderer. They want to do that, but they're not doing it consistently. So in the same way, it's looking at a person and saying, if this person hates consistently, then that person is a murderer from God's perspective. And we know something, that this new life is not remaining in him. It's not talking about, many people read this, and they read it incorrectly because they don't understand the intent of the Greek grammar. What it's saying here is this new life isn't consistently in him. 
He is consistently hating. He is consistently wanting to not love another. Not thinking about how he can bless that person, be a positive influence, be a testimony. He's not thinking this way. He's thinking of himself. So the scripture is simply saying here, there's not a consistency of, of this new life. Here it's eternal life, which is kingdom life in him. It's not consistently there. It's not remaining. Verse 16. In this we have known. Now, there's a change. Here we're dealing with the perfect when it says, in this we, we have known. Meaning, we've known this in the past, we know it now, and this is something that's going to continue on into the future. Once more, verse 16, in this we know the love of God. Here's the description of the love of God. Hear how it's been manifested to humanity. Because, and it says, that one. Now, again, most English Bibles will say, because he, in behalf of us, his life he gave. Translating it literally in this same order of the text. But, but what I want you to see here is it says, that one. Why that one rather than he? Because that one makes it a demonstrative statement, which is one of emphasis. It stands out. It's not the normal construction that, that here he gives. No, that one. It wants to emphasize that one in a unique way. And of course, we're speaking about Yeshua. That that one in behalf of us, his soul, meaning his life. The word in Greek for soul can simply also be life. His life, he, he placed, he sat down, he laid down. And also, we read, we ought in behalf of the brothers. The life, that means our life, the life we ought to what? He says we ought to set, we ought to lay down. Now, what's it speaking about? Very simply, Messiah lived sacrificially. Sacrifice, giving. Setting thing down, letting go of it, not holding on to it. And it says that we should live in regard to our life, not holding on to our life at all costs. Now, this is one of the problems I have with, with this phenomenon known as the prepping, prepper movement totally unbiblical it's all about holding on to life above all costs no what we should do is not want to hold on to life but be willing to lay down our life recently i i had a conversation with someone and he was speaking and i won't go into all the background but he was saying now brooke the government you, you may be on their list well so what what do we have to hide? We are not someone trying to camouflage, conceal our identity as, as followers of Messiah. If there's a list of believers that the government is holding, I want to be on that list. And when they come rounding us up, I want to go forth and meet them. I'm not going to camouflage, hide, be ashamed, and want to hold on at all costs to, to my earthly life. The Bible says one with that mindset loses his life. But the one who's willing to lose his life for Messiah's sake, and that means also for others' sake, in Messiah's name, this one finds life. So we don't hold on to life. That's not what it's about. We're willing to lay down our life, give our life, live sacrificially. This is what it's talking about here. Now look at verse 17. Whom should have the, the goods of the world? Many material things. Now, is there wrong? Is this scripture saying it's wrong to have those things? It is not. In fact, it can be a blessing. It can be God's will that you have the things of this world. Don't let those things have you. But you can possess them. And you can utilize them for kingdom purposes. And I know so many people that do just that. 
They have a wonderful testimony of generosity, of giving, of wanting. I know several families, and we almost hesitate sometimes to make a need known because we know if we share this need, we know that these four, five, six families are going to just immediately respond. We want to help. We want to help. We want to help. What a tremendous, tremendous testimony. So it's, it's wonderful to be a person like this. What it's saying here, look again at, at verse 17. Whoever should have the, the goods of the world and sees his brother having need. Now, it's fine that he has the good of the world if he, if he gets them honorably, properly, justly, through hard work, acquiring them legally, morally. It's fine that he has the goods of the world. But when he sees his brother having need, and here's the problem, not that he gives like so many of the ones that I know, but the problem is when this one should close the, and the word here has to do with, with compassion. It has to do with a, a feeling of, of just yearning to help. This is a, a great word. It's related to the, the bowels of an individual in the sense that that innermost seat of feelings. And there are people, when they hear of a need, they're just moved by that. That inner seat of feelings, I want to help. That's what they say. What a tremendous testimony. And thank God that, that many of them have the goods in order that they can help and meet needs. So it's not a problem having these things. As I said, the problem is when they possess you. So he says, verse 17, whom should ever have the goods of the world and sees his brother having need? And here's the problem. Not that he has those things, but he closes up the, the, the seat of his compassion unto him. How does the love of God remain in this in him in this one in this person that's the issue not what his resources are but what he does with those resources when there is a legitimate need he sees someone hurting that's the key this one should respond utilize what he has to meet the legitimate needs of others this is what it's saying and that's why, look now at verse 18, he says, my children. Your Bible says little children, doesn't say that. My children. We've learned and learned and learned. This is a term of endearment. It speaks about a family relationship. Those who are part of the community of faith. And, and John is speaking here like a, a one who has authority as a father, He's providing, he's teaching, he's discipling, he's giving wisdom. And he says, once more, verse 18, my children, we do not love, and the implication is we ought not to, we should not love by, by word and, and just by, by speech, by language. But, and this means but rather. So our love, it's fine to love with word and with, with speech, but not just by, but rather what we need to do is accompany those words if we say anything, but it should be with deed and in truth. Now, the deed, the work that we should love with works, doing things, actions, that's obvious, but those actions need to be according to the truth. Very, very important. We need to realize that there's limited resources. And therefore, we want to give in a way that is true, meeting legitimate needs. Now, if it's a case where I'm not sure, it's better to give. The scripture talks about that. It's, it's better to give, and if someone takes advantage of you, someone has misled you in their need, it's still better to give. And it's not legitimate than to hold back and miss out on giving in a, a real need to a real situation that needs help. So we don't want to clean. We don't want to just, just you know, close our hearts and use that 
as an excuse not to give. But we need to give according to deed and truth. Verse, verse 19, second part. He says, first part of verse 19. And in this we know that from the truth we are. Now he's going to be speaking about an inner condition. Speaking about the Spirit of God confirming things to us. That's why he says, look again, verse 19. And in this we know that from the truth we are. And before him, our hearts are, are persuaded. This means that inwardly we have that, that, that confirmation from our heart, that, that inner point in our life that, that, that speaks the thoughts, the, the seat of not feelings, but thoughts. There's a difference. The bowels, that word in Greek, the seat of emotions, feelings, and such. But this is the seat of thoughts, the heart of man. So he says, in this we know that from the truth we are, and before him our, our heart hearts are persuaded. Because if, if our hearts should condemn us, now he's speaking about something different. He says, on one hand, the heart might, might be out of the truth. We know it confirms, but if our hearts condemn us, notice what he says. If our hearts condemn us, we have, notice this, because greater is God than our hearts and he knows all things so even when our heart condemns us god he knows all things and he can go to work and he can set things straight he can bring about a change so we need to constantly what is speaking about and there's a term in hebrew cheshbon nefesh cheshbon nefesh cheshbon is is tallying up, counting something, reckoning something, and, and deriving a conclusion, a, a conclusion from gathering up this information. So he says, if our heart confirms to us something, God knows all things, he knows what the problem is, and God, even when we condemn ourselves, God is greater than that. And therefore, he can bring about a change, a righteous change in our life. He says in verse 21, Beloved ones, if our heart does not condemn us, so now we feel confidence, and the next word is that, confidence we have with God, that, that God as well is telling us that, that we're not condemned in something. In this case, what's it good to do? Pray. When we are right with God, that his thoughts are our thoughts, there's an agreement between us. This tells us now we're ready to pray. He says here, verse, verse 22, And if we ask, we will receive from him, because his commandments we, we keep. So now what he's saying is we need to take that spiritual inventory, cheshbon nefesh, a spiritual inventory. If we find ourselves not at peace within, that, that we're not walking with God, we need to repent, we need to bring these things before him, God knows all things, God can bring change in our life. We're not ready to pray. See, this is something so important. There are times when you're not ready to pray to beseech God, to ask God from things. Why? Because your heart is not established. Your heart's not correct. Your heart has been deceived. You're not thinking properly. You do not have that, that confidence spiritually. So God needs to bring about a change. He's greater than our heart. He can change it. He can conquer those, those obstacles. But if the situation is we have confidence now, that we are right with God, that we're thinking a godly way, that we want the purposes of God. Then he says, if this is the case, we, we have 
confidence with God. Therefore, he says, and if we should ask, we will receive from him because the commandments, his commandments, we keep. And the things pleasing, so important. When I keep the commandments of God, I am doing those things, this is what verse 22 says, that are pleasing before him. We're doing the things that are pleasing before him, we are doing. And this is his commandment. Now, what is the primary commandment that gets everything going? Foundational, right here. That we should believe in the name of his son, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Just that simple. That's where the change begins. That's when salvation happens. I become that new creation. My heart is going to be transformed. I'm going to begin to be able to hear from God consistently. And when I go before him, he's going to show me those things that are not right and those things that are right. When I'm in that proper state, I now know how to pray. I can bring these petitions before God and know that, that he's going to, to respond. But it all begins. What's that primary commandment? That we believe in the name of his son, Messiah Yeshua, in the name. Now, those who teach, and unfortunately there's many, that if I believe in the law of Moses, I say the law of Moses is good. I believe in the God of Israel. I, I believe that there's a Messiah coming, a Redeemer. But, but Yeshua, that name, no, I, I reject that. You reject that name, Yeshua. You reject everything. Now here again, I always get letters. Does it have to be Yeshua, that Hebrew name? No, it can be Jesus, Jesus, whatever language. That name is how it's pronounced in your language. Obviously, that's fine. It's not elevating a language. It's elevating the identity of the Messiah, the proper identity. Yeshua, I mean, it's right, Jesus of Nazareth. So when we accept him, when we believe in that name, everything changes. Look now to the second part of verse 23. He says, in that name, there's going to be change. And what is that change? How is it going to be manifested? That we love one another. There it is, whether it says your neighbor, your brother, you love one another. Just as he gave to us the command. Now, what this scripture does, and this is so significant that you see this. When I know that name, Yeshua, I accept him. I believe in him then that's going to manifest itself with me having the ability that call is upon me and i want to fulfill it where i love one another i love others this is the commandment that his name is going to make make, make me a committed one too i'm going to be committed to loving one another when i know his name and believe in his name last verse verse 24 and the one that keeps his commandments it's in the plural now it begins just with one love that name believe in the name yeshua that's going to manifest itself out in a general way that you're going to love another that's the 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 message of the torah that is that torah character that's the law but but we are going to grow and mature and keep all of his commandments that's what we're going to desire to do the one who keeps his commandment in him he remains and he so first of all that one in hebrew we have the term poloni which just means anyone and that one poloni is going to remain in messiah and then it says and he this is messiah in him and in this we know that, that he remains in us. Why? Well, because from the Spirit, which to us he's given. Now, I'm going to close. This is the end of chapter 3, but I want to close with something that's very significant, the word order. That, that from the Spirit, whom and what's emphasized to us he gave. He emphasizes to us 
greater than the giving of it. And what that tells us is he gave his spirit. That's a wonderful thing. But he gave it for us, to us, but for us. It's speaking about how we, we understand it from the emphasis of the original Greek. It's simply teaching us how utterly and totally dependent we are if we're going to walk with him be pleasing to him reflect that character do his will how absolutely dependent we are on his spirit so we believe in his name we become a recipient of his spirit this is going to his spirit is going to work in our life how well here's the problem people do not put together the scriptures as the scriptures are given to us how does this verse begin look again we're closing in just a moment but notice what it says here first john chapter first john chapter 3 and we're going to look at the last verse of this chapter where he says where he says about the one who keeps keeps his commandments it's in the plural in him he remains this one remains in him in yeshua and Yeshua in him. And in this we know that he, Yeshua, remains in us. Here's the proof. From his spirit that he has given to us. What I want you to see is the relationship between what he says at the beginning and what he says at the end. The beginning about keeping his commandments. And then he speaks about him giving us his spirit. What's the only conclusion that we can draw from that? It is that His Spirit in me will move in my life, function in my life to cause me, convict me first, and give me the ability to keep His commands, to be obedient. And this is what John is saying, that the true believer, the one who remains in Him, is going to demonstrate him in our life and us in him through obedience to what his commandments if if we set aside the commandments of god oh they're in the past or we do something that's very unwise and we talk about well those are jesus commands not moses we need to see there's unity those things that yeshua taught more often than not they can be directly linked to the commandments of Moses but even when there's something that that's not it still meets with the same character that righteousness that the law describes again the law is not an instrument that makes one so righteous but it manifests it confirms it gives us the definition a heavenly definition of what is righteous so no, we're not saved by keeping the law but being saved, we are going to demonstrate the character of the law, the purpose of the law, what God intended when he gave us those, those instructions. This is what we are reading about in the New Covenant through this author, John. Well, I'll close with that, and next week we'll begin a very significant chapter, this fourth chapter, and it has so much valuable significant information for us in this present time and as we move closer to the last days. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>